Hi everyone. So my name is Janisha Gandhi. I'm a senior producer at Red Hill Games. Today I wanted to talk about mastering the core development mindset. Uh, I've been in the uh, I've been working in Codev for the past seven to eight years with different companies as a producer for Associate Studios, and I wanted to share my experience on how we can work well with Lead Studios in making the game better, working on new features, and being part of their team. So just quickly, I'll be giving a quick introduction about myself, my experience, what is co-development, the difference between co-dev and outsourcing, uh, pillars of successful co-dev, stages of co-dev, my personal failures and learnings, and uh, my key takeaways. So as I mentioned, I'm a senior producer at Red Hill Games from Helsinki. I'm originally from India. Uh, I have over a decade of experience in production and I love making games. It's my passion, my dream come true. And I'm a proud dyslexic, which I personally feel helps me in my job. So, so some of the games I've worked on in my career, AAA games, uh, Steep in Ubisoft India, uh, South Park, The Fractured Butthole, uh, Riders Republic, Star Wars Outlaws at Ubisoft Massive, and uh, most recently we've been working with Blizzard Entertainment in Codev at Red Hill Games on Overwatch 2. So what is Codev? So Codev is a collaborative process in which multiple parties come together to uh, multiple parties come together for one common goal which is making the game better, shipping features. Usually a codev uh, consists of a lead studio and an associate studio. An associate studio works on the lead studio's IPs. And we share uh, experience, resources, uh, you know, collaboration and to achieve the common goal. So just a quick overview of what I feel is the difference because I've been asked this question many, many, many times by a lot of people and I keep correcting them that we are a codev, not outsourcing. So the four checkpoints according to me and my experience on what differentiates codev and outsourcing. Uh, the first one being the nature of collaboration in a codev. As I mentioned, you are more part of the team. Of course, it starts with working on smaller features of the lead studio, and eventually when you gain their trust and you understand what the game is about, their pipeline, then you start owning more features. In, uh, in outsourcing, I think the nature of collaboration is more transactional and limited, and it's very specific to what exactly you need to deliver. Uh, the objective and focus, so in Codev, our objective and focus is to become part of the lead studio's team. And in outsourcing, it's very limited. A lot of outsourcing studios might just, if I, if I share an example, might just do maybe art assets using 3D tools, but might not work on the engine, the engine integration. In Codev, you also work on proprietary engines of uh, lead studios, and you own the asset or you own things from start to end. The level of integration, as I mentioned, it's being part of their pipelines, their processes, understanding what the lead studio is, how they do things, and uh, trying to help them make the game better. In outsourcing, it's very limited. It's really what the you know what your contract is and what the lead studio would like you to do. How limited you are, and the degree of ownership. So. This is, again, I speak with my experience, the degree of ownership gets very high when you're a codev studio because you start owning big, big, big features very soon and you reach a point with them where the lead studio is like, okay, why don't you make this feature X with your team and your expertise? So. I'll share a story of mine on Overwatch. So there is this feature we worked on at Red Hill called Hero Mastery. So we started off with, okay, we have this idea where you know we want to make 
a simulation training session of different characters where players can explore their abilities with training bots. So we started by supporting them and eventually we pitched an idea as well of having a Hero Mastery Gauntlet. All this is live on Overwatch 2, so please play it. So. Uh, we pitched an idea of having a tower defense kind of a mode, Hero Mastery Gauntlet. They liked it and they told us, you just, you know, go ahead, make it, pitch us your ideas and tell us how you would like to do this. And uh, we did and it worked out pretty, pretty well. So what are the successful pillars of a codev relationship? It's not that easy. It takes a lot of time to reach a position where you know they really trust you. And uh, these points that I have mentioned here, I would like to thank Ubisoft Annecy because I got to work with them being an associate studio at Ubisoft India on Steep and Riders Republic. And I learned this from Greg and Daniel Palix, two of the uh, people there. So the first thing is autonomy. So just to speak on what lead studios expect, when they get into a code of partnership with you, the end goal is to make you and your team very autonomous, where they can just hand you know, features, hand tasks to you, and you just go ahead and do it. I will get through the process of this later on in my presentation. The quality, of course, everyone wants good quality. But quality also is a bit of perception on what really is good quality. It's important for CodeF Studios to understand what is the quality requirement that the lead studio has and how can we push those boundaries, make it much better with our experience and our expertise. Trust. <clears throat> Trust is built over time. It's not easy that you get a project and they trust you, but it takes a lot of time of building relationships with people at the lead studio, proving yourself and understanding them. And effective communication. So here when I speak about effective communication, it's not only sending you know, your weekly reports or uh, data-driven uh, updates. It's also about keeping the lead studio and their counterparts in loop of every decision that is being made. Because in games, there are so many disciplines and teams involved. One wrong communication can have a huge, huge drastic effect on the deliveries and milestones. <coughs> So why co-development? So why I would encourage lead studios and companies that, you know, why are we doing co-development? So before I go on the slides here, uh, in my own company, Red Hill Games, we had our own IP 9 to 5, but we made a decision to move towards co-dev to, you know, to get more experience and obviously to work on really cool AAA games. So. Uh, co-development because one, you have access to specialized talent. Though we are a codev studio, I think people who are in codev studios, they come with vast different backgrounds, experiences, who worked on really big games. So it's always nice to have, uh, it's always nice to connect with such people so that, so that you have more to learn, more to do, and more ideas as well. Learning and growth. So for us in CodeF, it's a great opportunity to work with different AAA companies, learn from them and grow as well because they do bring in a lot of expertise and the way they do things, it, it does work for them and their games. So it's a great learning for us. Scalability, so we can always, of course, in a CodeF studio, you end up scaling your team. So when we started CodeF in uh, Overwatch, we, were a, we weren't that big of a team, we were pretty small. And naturally, the, naturally the team grew because uh, the lead studio was really happy with our work and they wanted to grow the team as well. So we ended up doubling our team size and we got more people to come and make cool stuff with us. And diversity. So we are all we all come from different backgrounds. I'm from India myself, so it's a great opportunity for me as well to come, you know, outside India and work with other companies and represent my country. So we have a different mindset, a different perspective, which always helps in uh, doing things differently. 
So one question, when we start any co-development, in my experience, it's very important for producers and leads to know how to embed their team. So the first thing is <clears throat> play the game. I know a lot of people, you know, with experience, a lot of people in the dev team, they play, but then actually play the game and understand what is it that the game is communicating to the players, who are the players, what does the community think about the game, what can be better, what do you feel about the game. So play, 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 always keep playing the game. Um, Understand the lead studios, pipelines, and processes. Usually, when you enter a code dev partnership, you do have you do have a certain period of time where the lead studio will onboard you, explain how they do things, their proprietary engines, what their expectations are. It's very important for us to first, you know, get into the depth of how they do things be part of their team and slowly you can definitely pitch your own ideas of processes of how or how you want to do things. So always take smaller assignments first just to understand and then slowly, slowly once you prove that yes, you understand, you have delivered, then slowly they, they themselves will give you bigger features to manage and keep delivering consistently. It's not that, okay, I delivered once and I'm done. No, you have to do better. You have to pitch ideas to them and talk maybe the tech language, get to know their people. So keep delivering better and better and push their game to be better. So the stages of co-development. So before I talk about the stages of co-development, I wanted to thank uh, Seth and Clive from the Overwatch team who really explained to us when we started the collaboration with Blizzard on, how, on, on what they expect and what the stages are. So the first stage is crawl. So crawl stages when you just enter, you're getting to know people, you're onboarding, you're learning about their engines, you're learning on how they do things. Different teams have different expectations, different pipelines, trying to get everyone on board and slowly working on maybe small small things, small tasks that might not be super uh, you know, crucial, but just so that you understand things at a larger level. We have the walk stage. So the walk stage is, okay, we are done onboarding you and now you guys need to start trying to do things on your own. And we are there to help you, guide you, if you're lost, if you're confused. But you take the initiative and you start working on things. Run. The run stage is, okay, now we've understood, we get even your feedbacks on what you expect. So we have understood people's mindsets and now we start working on bigger features. Maybe within our own teams we make something. and we send it to the lead studio. Fly, the fly stage is when, when the code dev studio comes up with an idea and they pitch it to the lead studio for their game. It's more like you're consulting them that maybe if we do this or that, it might be better. So the example I shared with you all about Overwatch uh, Hero Mastery was an idea by, uh, by Corey, one of the designers, and we worked with them. And uh, Hero Mastery Gauntlet was our idea and you know, we pitched it to them, they liked it. And with their help, we ended up owning the whole feature. We did everything in-house in from art, design, UI, and uh, they were always there to help us. So the same thing, another example I can share is uh, during my journey at Ubisoft India, we came up with this idea of this tool shotgun on how to embed it in their uh, Anvil pipeline because we wanted to help and make our artists' life much easier in reviews and how to track assets. So we, we pitched this idea, came up with a MVP, started using it internally, and Ubisoft Annecy, they saw how beneficial it is and they also adopted this. So usually the stages, how long they last, the crawl stage, I mean, it really depends on your partnership with the lead studio and, and how, you know, how fast they want you to deliver. But based on my experience, usually the crawl stage is, you know, zero to three months, walk stage is three to six months, 
uh, run stage is six months to like nine months. And after you're done of being in a partnership with them for nine months, you have to be in a position to be more autonomous, you know, maybe make healthy decisions and keep them in the loop why these decisions matter for the game for them. Of course, the lead studio always has the last say, but I'm pretty sure if you build that relationship with them, they will respect and listen to you. So some of my failures and learnings, I was very lucky to fail very early on in my codev journey. I started my career as an associate producer for Ubisoft India on Steep, my first codev project, I think seven years back. And uh, we had a gameplay programming team. We made the, maybe we didn't make the best decision on how do you grow a team? What are the kind of people you want to first get into the team if you're starting a new partnership? And uh, we ended up working on their features, but obviously it was not the best. We couldn't understand their expectations when it came to maybe coding standards, when it came to what is it that the game needs? What is, what is it that they are expecting from us? And in six months, we lost the collaboration, so the entire team was off the project except me. So thank you to Ubisoft Annecy for still believing in me. And then I grew another collaboration with them that was character art and tools. And we became a huge team of 50 people in India itself working on really, really cool stuff for them, owning big parts of the game. So my key takeaways from how do you master co-development, it's very important to understand that autonomy, transparency, and quality is what lead studios want more than anything else. And it's not that easy, but it is possible. Um, leveraging the strengths of codev studios, though we might be codev and we, we might not have our own IPs, but everyone brings something unique to the table and brings in talent. So leveraging those talent to make help make your game better is always a nice idea. The stages of codev, as I mentioned, the crawl, walk, run, and fly stage. It, this has been my experience in so many codev projects. That's how it usually works. It's important for codev studios to understand the timeline that the lead studios expect in these stages. So you can align your team and work accordingly. Work, uh, I mean, benefits of codev partnerships. Well, we, I think I already spoke about it. Uh, we get to work on many several projects, Codev Studios, so we learn from so many AAA studios and we can always transition the knowledge with new partnerships. Working on multiple projects, yeah, I mean, who doesn't want to work on so many AAA games? For me personally, it was a dream come true to work with Blizzard and learn and see how they do things. So, so super grateful for that. Um, and building relationships. In a codev partnership, it's not transactional. It's more about building the right relationships with people. I have personally experienced that when you build great relationships, you know, uh, talk to them, get to know them as well, not just by delivering, but actually learn about their background and maybe, you know, uh, meet them in person. It really, really makes a huge difference, and the trust is, uh, I mean, the, and the trust is grown really fast. And thank you. It was a short presentation. I hope you liked it. I'm open to any questions. Hi. Uh, so first question, uh, I guess, like, what uh, what is the business model for for you? Like, y uh, the lead co uh, lead studio is funding you, or you have to put uh, your resources uh, to work with them? So that's a great question, but. I'm a producer, I speak with my production experience, so take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> um, usually how it happens is that if, you know, Codev Studios, if they reach out to lead studios, or lead studios reach out to us that we want, you know, to work with you, they're very clear on the number of people they need and even the disciplines they need. So we have our resources, we have our team ready to take on new projects and, uh, that's the most I can say from a business standpoint, money, I'm not the right person, I'm sorry, because I'm very much involved in production more than anything else. Okay, thank you.
how you talked that you have when you are doing eco development you have some quite big degree of ownership and how do you define the autonomy boundaries because still the lead studio has to make their own decisions how do you collaborate in terms of autonomy with their producers and do you embed their designers into your team or how, how this collaboration looks especially between producers and designers so i'll share i'll share a bit more about my experience on hero mastery with blizzard because it's the most recent experience i have so when we started this game mode called hero mastery uh, the designer they came up with this idea from blizzard that they wanted to make this of course it went through a lot of you know uh, higher people there on the overwatch team and uh, when they told us we we started with concepts and art and even the designers making prototypes on what it is that they want the designer on their side was finalizing everything of course but they gave us the freedom to actually experiment within a creative box of what you know of what does this game mode mean so we started uh, working around that and 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 then they said yes no and based on their feedbacks we could actually move things forward a lot of times during my journey on hero mastery i had artists and designers come up with new ideas explain their points on why this makes more sense than that i can't talk a lot cuz i'm still under nda but yeah why this you know why point a doing something like point a makes more sense will add more value than point b so you really need to explain to them and understand and most most of the time and you know the companies i've worked with in codev they've been really really nice and cordial and respectful to our decisions of course they might say no but that's fine and uh, when we did hero mastery gauntlet our designer pitched this idea to the designer there at blizzard they shared a, they have a great bond so they really liked it went to the higher ups in blizzard they said okay let's do it and then uh, the designer told us that okay we can make this so our designer took the lead on uh, defining you know the tower defense mode of uh, hero mastery gauntlet having three uh, having three characters and the art team was working with them very closely and of course all the decisions are always the lead studios but this would be the difference of autonomy where you reach a position where you can pitch a game mode idea to them and not the other way around and how often did you get the feedback from their designers is it daily by daily you have a things once a week just once a month how often so we used to get feedbacks uh, on a daily basis and we had syncs on a weekly basis we used to also share builds with them so that they could play and experience the game modes so i think the biggest advantage being that you know being in helsinki and america you have time difference so when we are sleeping we get to know what the feedbacks are what they want and when they are resting we work on things so we kept the communication very transparent we had many different uh, channels where we used to share and talk everything even internally if artists designers programmers were talking it was always on a common channel where blizzard was aware so they knew what exactly we are planning to do and if they felt that no this doesn't make sense we would get the reply by next morning so that's what you know, i think it's a great example of effective communication yeah oh, thanks for the nice talk and sharing your experience first of all uh, i'd like to follow up uh, on your conversation here uh, as you mentioned uh, the client the lead studio has always the last word right and sometimes the last word is no <laughs> yes <laughs> but not always uh, uh, i would like to ask uh, about how uh, do you have any strategy or tools uh, about uh, for determining uh, when it's final whether it's you know just their suggestion their opinion how hard they are on their stance you know um and what do you do then you just uh, take it on the face value or do you have uh, any you know plan b or c in mind maybe there's some interesting story about uh, such a situation you have to share um so 
That's a nice question. <laughs> Uh, I think usually when the lead studios, because like like I said, they have the final say of saying yes or no for everything. It's their IP. So we are very, very much aware and we align the teams as well that see it is their IP first. We are part of their team. And because a lot of times I think people get so invested and they think that, okay, it's my game. I have free reigns to make decisions. Probably, but not all. It's finally, it's theirs. So... Though there have been many times in my career in uh, Kodev where, you know, we don't agree with each other. But uh, what we do is most of the time we have to say, okay, naturally, you know, the best decision. They understand the business value, the business need, which we might not be aware of. Because at the lead studio level, they are talking with so many different people. We are just a Kodev production department and we might not have, you know, the, uh, I mean, the longer vision that they have for their game. So it's important for producers to align with their producers to understand why they are doing this, why this decision was made. You can always talk to them. And I believe it's really important to have healthy arguments, but keeping in mind the reality that if they say no, try to understand why it might actually make sense. So a lot of decisions we are unaware of being codev because naturally it's under their NDA and their future plans. But if you build, you know, if you build that trust and bond, most of the people will actually tell you why they said no. It's not just, hey, no, don't do it. They will, they will explain to you. So that's, I think, more that what producers and leads need to figure out because we are answerable to our team and teams ask us why. So we figure this out and then we tell them that this is the situation. So sorry, guys, we can't do this. Or if a feature is cut, which happens a lot in games, you're working on a feature for so long and suddenly, guys, sorry, it's cut. It's happened with me many, many times. So the team gets a bit demotivated. But then we say, OK, it's fine. It doesn't make sense because you know, uh, maybe the feature that we are working on might not add any business value. It might not make sense. So people understand and then they work on other cool stuff which will actually release. So for the team, it's always better to work on things that will release than, you know, working on features that have a very small chance of releasing and be shown to the players. Uh, did you have any experience with a uh, problematic uh, client? Like he's lagging with sending assets and you depend on their work and or they changing w uh, anything without your information or just causing you a problem? Did, did you have any experience? Uh, yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, a lot of experience. So um, I'll share a story, but as I'm on NDA, it'll be a bit more generic, so bear with me. Uh, I had a bunch of artists, and we were working on, um, you know, characters for a project. So this project was very picky and in-depth because of, of course, they have to be. It's their game. So we used to really, really push our artists to work hard, and we realized that it's actually, you need to be more technical than be creative. You need to understand the technical aspect of how things work and not just be like, okay, I can go rogue and start making my own art. And uh, we had a situation where we had not one, three people give us feedbacks. So how do you manage that? Because three people who give feedbacks come from, you know, have different perspectives. So the artist is in a loop of just changing things, changing things and not moving forward. Then you have a fourth person who comes and gives feedbacks. So how does a producer help the team and, you know, say no or push the lead studio back that, guys, this is the deadline, sorry, make a decision. So at times we try, like at times, at least for me at a producer level, I do, you know, I do say no where I think that it's important or I do push them or, or set their expectations that, okay, we've had like maybe 20 changes. We are still in maybe the blockout stage for the past one month. But in the next three months, we need to deliver the asset because it's going in a milestone. So what is the decision? Or if they, if they still don't have a decision, sometimes I've even stopped working on the feature and I'm like, sorry, till you don't make a decision, we're not going to do it anymore. 
because they also need to realize and they also need to be very clear on their thoughts and talk with their team that okay what is the vision because things keep changing because of dependencies so i think you know having the heart and pinching yourself to say no and uh, putting your foot down really helps them also align on things thank you uh, hey i have a question for like uh, what works for you with games of rewards like revenue share or flat fees and penalties like ah. That's what a, works? What's a I mean, that's a great question. It's really, uh, being honest, it's a very business-driven question. So we have a business team who handles this. Unfortunately, I'm not fully aware on how this is handled because I'm more production-driven. I just focus on getting things done. So this is something I will definitely ask and I will get you this answer. But today, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Uh, hello, and thank you for the talk. It was amazing. Uh, I have a more uh, opinion-based question from your perspective, if your observations working in the industry, uh, because CodeF is a thing that's more and more uh, on the talk nowadays than in the past. Uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts regarding uh, will CodeF be a, become a norm and uh, more developers, more publishers start investing in it instead of uh, outsourcing. So, um, according to my experience, I see you know I see a lot of studios moving into Codev because it's a bit more business savvy from what I've understood than just taking the risk of making your own IPs. I have also been part of studios where you have a Codev section and you have a set group of people making their own IP because you have because you're getting money from code you're getting money from the lead studio, so you have enough money to invest in making a new IP as well. So I think for me personally, I would love being in a codev. I've been in a lead studio before as well. But the best advantage for developers, producers, why we should think about being in codev is because you get to work on really cool stuff. One, because you get to work with the best companies. If Naturally, it's on your luck and your business team if they get the projects. But you get to work on cool AAA projects. You're not stuck with one for like five years, six years. It depends on the contract. And you don't need to deal with, you know, the lead studio uh, chaos, which is always a breath of fresh air. It's more like they are figuring it out. They have their chaos. I've seen it happen while I was in Codev of how, it, how chaotic it is. And we are just more at, hey guys, we decided this is what we want to do. So we start making things with a little less stress and more passion, I feel. So you get things out, your name is in the credits, you're still part of the team, you can always say, hey, on my resume, I have Steep, Overwatch, Star Wars, and uh, still be, you know, still be considered a game dev for them. Any more questions? So thank you so much, and thank you Digital Dragons for having me. Uh, super happy I got a chance to speak about Codev. If you guys have more questions or you would like to talk, feel free to just grab me. I'll just be roaming around. So come say hi. Thank you so much. <laughs>